Hello, everyone. Thank you for tuning in again to another episode of Team Superheroes. If you haven't watched many of these videos, the whole premise of them was as I was speaking to a bunch of customers around the globe as part of my role in Microsoft's customer success group, I heard a lot of similar questions, challenges, concerns, and opportunities when it came to Teams and the platform component of Teams, the business I look after. And the whole premise here, again, is I wanted to start addressing those questions from our Teams engineering PMs and also from your peers around the world. And the one you're about to hear is addressing one of the most common questions I get all the time around centers of excellence, or how do we manage this concept of citizen development in our organization? Because yes, Microsoft, it's great that you want to uh, allow everybody to use Power Platform, but who's going to manage that? Who's going to support it? How do we enable different business groups within our organization to align with IT and create these incredibly powerful solutions that help them innovate at work and make their lives easier? And so I want you to hear this very refreshing perspective, an honest perspective from Tom and Ron over at Wiley, John Wiley Publishing in New York. Fantastic couple of gents, and they'll walk you through their experience creating their center of excellence inside Wiley. The reason why we got to doing what we do started with the internet. Started with a terrible internet. Yeah, uh, it all starts with a terrible, a terrible internet. internet. And uh, then, uh, and we were all in different. Story. Yeah, <laughs> we, we were <laughs> all in different departments. So, like, like at the time, it's not the case now, but at the time, internal communications was within human resources, sure. and technology communications was within IT. Um, the other key people on the team uh, were from application management in IT and from communications within product technology, which was another group entirely. Um, so from day one, we were a, a distributed uh, a team with no formal reporting structure. And fast forward to three years later today, a lot of people have moved around. Tom and I have continued to work together specifically around Office 365, and that's been the working model that was almost like randomly yeah. created, but because it was successful, there were times over the years, because that, that model was successful, the head of HR, um, once we were toward the end of wrapping up the launch of the internet, um, she sort of plucked, I was still within HR and still within communications on paper as a formal reporting structure, but she plucked me out of that group and had meetings with Tom and I to say like, this works, this non-reporting structure, um, non-hierarchical problem solving team works. So just continue to do that. We don't work within IT. We, yeah. we kind of, and Tom and I are currently even in the same department. Gotcha. I'm in the um, communications and branding group and Tom's in more of like the operations side. Is it, is it just you two by the way? Is there other resources there? We're the only two that are, I guess, full time yeah, on toward this. this so you kind of pull in resources, and we, yeah. and we pull in people. There's a couple of people that are, are constantly being pulled in, but I, like Rebecca's constantly right. being pulled in, but she's not literally on it every day. So usually, what we'll do is someone will have a problem, uh, and they'll almost by word of mouth reach out to Tom or I um, because they've been exposed to a prior project, or because they've read about something on Yammer, or s something to that effect. And uh, they'll reach out and, say, and, and, and start with a question, like, hey, I have sure. this problem. Um, you know, what can I do? How do, and, yeah, how do, I, how do we fix this? Yeah. How do I... Or I need help with this process. Or uh, is there an application that does this? Or, or something like that. It's just a question. And then uh, pretty quickly we'll loop in the other person and, uh, and put a team together that's usually about 50% uh, their department. Right, so if it's HR, like half the people in the room are, are HR people that are on this project or, or this problem. And 50%, me, Tom, and whomever else we think uh, you know, could contribute to a, a solution. You know? So what does that look like? So they, they come to you with a problem, you've got now your project team, so to speak, essentially set up to, to solve the issue. What does that process look like from there? So. Um, it's evolved. It has evolved for the better. Because there was a meeting very early on, and it was Ron and I and someone from HR, and she's like, these are the requirements. If anyone tells you differently, tell them they're wrong because this is it. This is, this is what you have to build, and this is what you have to deliver. Yeah. Like, okay. So we did that. And then it was back to, well, we need to do a few more things, and we need to do this. And, and it just... 
and uh, it was just a chaotic mess. Yeah. Until one day. <laughs> one day we were like, okay, there's got to be a better way of working. And so we met with uh, some of the people in IT about different developmental or development methodologies. And um, we, yeah, we, sort of, we, sort of, we sort of, yeah, we sort of took a, a crash course in agile development. And then we modified that. We're like, okay, well, we don't have all of these different pieces to do this the same way that IT is doing it for major application development. Um, but we have things that we can use to simulate that and what we shed in manpower, we can make up for in flexibility. Um, so we started to use Planner as a agile Kanban board, and we just set up instead of in the buckets as feature requests in yeah, development, backlog. backlog, and you know, and and um, and then we added everyone from the HR team that was on this particular project, or the people that we brought in, like the designer and the user testing guy. We've added them all to the same plan. And then we changed the structure of our meetings to be like, okay, this meeting is going to be about what features we need. And we're gonna document that and we're gonna record all those features in And planner. put them in the backlog. And put them in the backlog. And then this meeting, uh, then after that, everybody that's tagged to a feature. Uh, that feature meeting was the first meeting, is that right? That'll be like the very first meeting, yeah. And we're like, let's, let's, let's talk about the features that we need. Um, and let's debate that, right? As opposed to like you're telling me you need this feature, and then the next meeting you're telling me we don't need this feature, right? Like we'll get everybody there for this feature meeting. Yeah, and then is this feature what you really want? Right. Like, as it, is this they, what really needs to be in the application, or is just what you think? So, and, and, and are you is everyone on the same page that this is a valuable feature? Um, that level of communication was important. So it put some structure to it that everybody was immediately able to see. And the meetings after that and the progress after that just went, it, it like changed night and day. It was yeah. suddenly everybody was not only aware of it, but they were invested in it because they had a part in the planning. They, the HR people were suddenly invested in the success of the project and understood what happened uh, you know, when something went wrong or who needed and help at a certain phase. And it was too, from, from a development point of view, you knew that the feature that you were working on that was requested, because there was discussion around it, wasn't just like you knew that you were putting something in there that had value rather than something that in the next go around, uh, you know what, well, we didn't want that anyway. Um, or, yeah. oh, you know, we thought about it and it really needed to be this instead of what we told you to build. Um, like you knew that those were vetted, discussed, and ready to go. And so it wasn't like as, you, as I was building it into Power App, I'm like, I know this is just going to go away next week, which is what was how it was in the beginning, which is. Yeah, why we were hating. Yeah, so there was, I mean, the, the the amount of work that was where it used to be done and undone and redone, like disappeared, yeah, uh, almost overnight. And now all the work was valuable from from that point on. Do you guys worry that if you're, and I'm asking you this because I know this is what a customer would be thinking who works for particularly a large organization, right? Is you know, you get to a point where your team has been so successful and you're creating, I don't know, fifty, hundred plus solutions for various departments around the company. What if some of them start breaking? Right or or, or need, some, need some fixing, right? Yeah. Does it you know initially that's probably easy to do, but what happens when you've got hundreds of months, yeah. tons of users? You have to know what you're getting into, yeah. and I think that's the same thing with the entire Microsoft 365 suite. It is there for you to use, and you are capable of using it. So if you don't, if you look at this with a an older world view of like application development or of technology where you would go to the IT department or you would go to a development group and they would build you a thing and then you would use that thing. Like that's one way you can look at it. And in that view of things, um, you don't really have any responsibility for the product. Right. You are a user of the product. You're not invested in the construction and maintenance of the product. You use it, if it breaks, you send it back. Um, in a newer way of looking at it where every user has access to these tools to do like whatever they want at any time uh, you know they don't need to come to us to build a power app or to build a form or to help them you know build a SharePoint list but, but we're there to help them do these things but the responsibility is still the same it is 
your tool. We've helped you build it, we've helped you get there, but it is still your tool. You do have the responsibility of ownership of this tool. And as long as we've done our job in, in helping you get to the solution, um, then, you know, then we've done our job. Not that we're abdicating responsibility for the future of this thing, because we will always be there to continue to help, whether it's something that needs to be created new or something that needs to be maintained ongoing. But it is not that old model of we built it, you use it. It's we, we all built this thing and you have full capability to help maintain it. If you recreated your group from the beginning, was there any advice you'd give your peers as they start thinking about creating a team like yours? Wow. <laughs> well, first, I mean, the don't, way... Don't take yourself very seriously. Yeah, yeah no, don't. Definitely not. Do not take yourself seriously. But and, I think that's just a life motto right there. Well, yeah. Yeah. The other thing, I mean, from the get-go, we when we knew we were launching the internet, we knew it was going to be an Office 365. Like we were like, we have to use these tools because we're going to be telling people to use the tools. So, like, we have to we have to walk the walk, talk that's, to talk, that's and true. and yeah. and just you know jump in there and you know look look across the entire universe of what's there and use it. Um, you know, become really familiar with it. And, and that was really what started us off, was like, well, we're gonna be telling everyone to use Office 365, so we really need to use these tools. Yeah. Um, and we need to use them in the way that we're telling people they will use them in the future, not the way they're using them currently. Um, so in, in the case where we launched the new intranet, uh, we stopped using email entirely, and we switched everything to Teams. And we made a team for the, the, the core product team, which was us, and then uh, additional stakeholders, they were in the team. We had channels set up for each aspect of it, whether it was you know, feature development or content or whatever it was. Um, so the project itself became education about the product. Sure. Like, if you wanted to replicate this group, or in your own company, I would say probably the look for people and I, I can't underscore this enough and, and I think that's where you and I do really well. It's forget the technologies. Forget the tools that are there. It's problem it's basic problem solving. This is this and, is such a great point. And that is really where it comes down to because at the end of the day, the tools that are there are to solve problems. They're a means to an end. But you have to think about, like, when, you, when you're listening to someone, that's also important. Just listen when someone comes and, and really listen to what, what they're really trying to get at. But, you know, what is the problem that we're trying to solve? It's not like, oh, we can use all this cool technology and try and solution it right away. But just, yeah, what, what are we really trying to get at? And I think... All too often, we forget that skill, and really, it's problem solving. Like, if you can get put together a team where you've got some people that can just listen and and think critically, and you know, envision a solution, and then try and think, okay, like this is how I think the problem should be, and I know at my disposal I have all these tools. Like, I look at I look across the 365 universe. I know I've got. Power Automate, I know I have SharePoint, I know I've got all these other things that I can use. How can I use these features to pull it in? Um, and just, yeah, problem solving. And I think we don't have enough of that. <laughs>